Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to speak as part of this symposium on a topic which is, of course, extremely important and uh, highly connected to the current crisis, which is often a topic of great debate and a lot of maybe uh, oversimplification because positions tend to be very radical about air transport now, and I think that that fails to take into account the social utility also of air transport. By way of introduction, maybe, I could point out that greenhouse gas emissions have already mostly rebounded. The International Energy Agency recently published figures for greenhouse gas emissions for the year 2020. It is known that emissions declined globally by 7 percent roughly after the pandemic. But what is significant is to see that emissions rebounded by 2 percent between December 2019 and December 2020. In other words, we are now globally once again at a level of emissions which is higher than the level we had before the pandemic. So fears of a re rebound in emissions once economic activity resumed are unfortunately confirmed. And as you know, this rebound is already a reality, whereas Roughly 70 percent of the international air industry is still at a standstill. At the same time as most planes were grounded before, between, during the pandemic, there's also been this uh, weird phenomenon of airlines that offered flights to nowhere. So flights where you would take off from an airport to come back to the same airport. Qantas did that. Singapore Airlines also offered this type of flights that were only about getting people to experience air travel once again, although that didn't take them anywhere. So, on the one hand, and in an almost contradictory manner, you've got this obvious aspiration of a part of the population to travel by air just for the fun of boarding an aircraft and seeing uh, the world from the sky, and also, obviously, the phenomenon that you talked about of flight shaming which is about making people guilty, feel guilty for taking planes. So the question is about whether it's possible to find a middle ground between people who would be ashamed of flying to travel and the people who would be ready to get on board a plane just for the pleasure of being up in the air, even though that doesn't take them anywhere. What is very striking to me in the current situation, which, as seen from Europe, is still a situation of closed borders, is to see that many wish to use this moment, this specific moment in the history of mankind to close borders for good. And now there's a very strong aspiration amongst populations for borders to stay closed definitively. If polls are anything to go by, two out of three French people wish for France's borders to remain closed, including after the pandemic. And so, in a way, the current health crisis would be an opportunity to close borders definitively. And so uh, the uh, new world imagined by many French people would be a world in which borders would be closed, closed to foreign visitors, of course, but also closed to uh, French people who would wish to travel abroad. So you may consider that in strict accounting terms of for greenhouse gas emissions, this border closure would be a good thing. But my fear, my great fear is also, well, 
not as a climate researcher and member of the IPCC, but as a citizen and a humanist, my great fear is that increasingly there's going to be a sort of conjunction of nationalistic agendas with radical environmental agendas. In a way, the idea of a world in which borders would be closed and where everybody would be holed up in their little home without any more international connections, without any more contacts with the outside, with, uh, with only local consumption and contacts reduced to what is strictly necessary, contacts with the people around you, that's the dream agenda for all nationalists and extremists of all kinds of all stripes and colors. And so uh, we understand that a number of uh, economic activities will have to be reonshored after the pandemic, but we'll need to keep our world relatively open and keep our democracies open. So the question of the future of air transport encompasses much more than the future change in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is a major part of the equation, but there's also a question about the political agenda and the shape of the world in which we want to live. Do we want to live in a world where everybody looks back on themselves and closes their borders, or are we going to be able to keep a world where borders are relatively open, where international trade and contacts would be many, uh, whilst also meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement? So. Here we are faced with the squaring of the circle, really, a problem which is uh, very difficult to solve, almost a dilemma. I think that in regards to that, there are two things that uh, the air transport industry should look at because everybody realizes that we won't be able in the future to go back to the situation exactly as it was before. My first point that I wanted to expound is that airlines should seize the opportunity offered by the crisis to reinvent themselves, including in their business models. We know that now a great number of short-haul flights can be replaced with high-speed train connection, and sometimes that will make you even save some time. I think that it would be beneficial for airlines in the future to see themselves more as transport companies and not just as air transport companies. So they should be able to strike partnerships with rail transport companies to bring passengers to the major international hubs so that a number of short haul flights can be performed by train, and trains might very well be operated by airlines. Now, there are still some flights between Brussels and Paris. Brussels and Paris, these are cities that are only one uh, hour 22 from each other using the high-speed train at Thales. So I hear what airlines have to say, that these flights that do not make sense, ecologically speaking, are here to bring passengers from one airport to the other in order to guarantee connections for passengers. But I think that it would be interesting for these connections to be made by train, even though that means that uh, you need to have facilitated luggage transport. You could have luggage handlers when you board and uh, de get off the train to make transfers easier. So I think that a large part of the future for European airlines will be about rethinking complementarity between planes and trains for short distances. Just as now we're thinking a lot about using, we're coming back to night trains, it's probably desirable, but a lot of travelers are not going to waste one night traveling between European capitals. But if you could have a major European high-speed 
rail network, there would be great uh, and desirable complementarity. I have other flights in mind where emissions are considerable. A big chunk of uh, aviation emissions are related to domestic aviation in the U.S., where there's no high-speed network and where a lot of cities are very poorly connected by rail. I'm still shocked to see that there are flights between Boston and New York, whereas these two cities could easily be connected by trains. Same between Sydney, Canberra, and Melbourne. Between Sydney and Canberra, there's almost one flight every 30 minutes, whereas it could be easy to have a rail connection between the two cities. So I think that, indeed, the air industry, the air travel industry, should reconsider the question of very short-distance flights if it wants to last in the future. The other aspect, the second out of three aspects that I wanted to talk about is the technological and technical question. It, we know that hydrogen engines are more and more developed. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have international flights powered by hydrogen within a few years. But there will still be a question, an essential question. Even if you can imagine that hydrogen engines will be available on f aircraft within a few years, it's unimaginable that airlines are going to renew the whole of their fleets within a few years. So in all airlines, there are going to be hydrogen-powered planes and kerosene-powered planes. Uh, there will be a matter of social justice and equity and fairness that will have to be solved especially when given the price of tickets that passengers are going to pay. I mean, it's imaginable that the price of tickets on hydrogen-powered planes is going to be higher than for those powered by kerosene. But I wouldn't want a, such a situation to exist in which the richest passengers can carry on flying with the satisfaction that their carbon footprint is relatively negligible, whereas the uh, less well-off passengers would have to make do with kerosene-powered planes. And so I think that it will be essential to really organize the uh, pricing strategy for air tickets when the technology comes on stream. The uh, most uh, recent development, probably the most important development, um, is that of uh, emissions accounting. Why? Well, we know that the air industry accounts for about 3% of all uh, ga uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, on the global scales. So you might think, well, that's not very much, and uh, as a whole, uh, the air industry doesn't generate much by way of uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, compared with, say, for instance, would you believe rice pads account for as much green ga greenhouse gas emissions as air transport because they generate lots of uh, methane, and uh, methane is uh, thr 30 times as uh, noxious as, as CO2. But if we look at the carbon footprint per passenger, well, then uh, the issue of uh, responsibility should be considered in a different way. In France, less than half the population has uh, traveled by air. Um, in around the world, about 15 percent uh, of the population uh, of, uh, uh, of mankind has, has been on a plane. Now, uh, as things stand today, you can't just look at uh, the uh, sort of uh, consolidated number of uh, emissions without looking at the uh, corresponding uh, social uh, usefulness. On a flight between Paris and New York, you may have passengers traveling to New York for a shopping spree on Fifth Avenue, uh, and uh, on the same plane, uh, students who are about to spend a whole year uh, as part of a student exchange in Columbia or NYU. Now, uh, for the student or the tourist, uh, the carbon footprint, of course, will be the same still. The social usefulness of their flights is completely different, isn't it? Now, uh, I, I think it's the sort of thing that you have to take into account. Literally, the uh, uh, carbon accounting should go beyond uh, sort of uh, grow, uh, uh, 
just gross numbers, but look at the uh, social usefulness. There should be a, a qualitative uh, uh, qualifi qualifying factor. Uh, when you travel for a good purpose, well, there may be some uh, something of a carbon footprint, but you might consider that that carbon footprint is a, is useful. At least it corresponds. It's the it's a fair price to pay for something useful. Conversely, uh, other flights can be uh, replaced by, I don't know, other meetings or uh, other uh, trips altogether. Uh, and then you might uh, consider, was it really necessary to uh, to make uh, to take uh, that plane to make that trip? And so uh, there has to be, you have to consider uh, the, uh, the social usefulness uh, of, of, of the trip and therefore of the carbon footprint. The air industry could look into this, but that would require a bit of uh, uh, of candidness and transparency. I'm afraid to say that there has been a fair amount of greenwashing in the air industry. But if you want to arrive at something more rational in terms of uh, greenhouse gas accounting that takes uh, into account uh, the social usefulness of uh, uh, such pollution, then you have to look well at all industries, not just the air industry. Uh, transparency then, of course, is uh, indispensable. So the these are the three aspects which I think are indispensable if we are to uh, reconcile, say, the, uh, uh, the usefulness of uh, air transportation and uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emission, which is the price you have to pay for that. Uh, you also have uh, short distance uh, flights that could be replaced by uh, rail links. The possibilities of uh, hydrogen-based fuels, uh, or sometimes uh, a, a low-tech uh, alternative using a propeller plane between Paris and Berlin, uh, you'd have a 30 percent. Well, you have 30 percent less uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and. Uh, and the duration of the flight would, do, would only be 20 minutes more. So for these short distances, propeller planes might be an alternative. And then another aspect, and that goes beyond the air industry alone, there's got to be an accounting of uh, emissions that goes beyond uh, the overall numbers, the consolidated number. We have to take on board the social usefulness. What is the benefit uh, in the cost-benefit analysis? Uh, you have to look at the benefit aspect, the social usefulness, the cost being the emission itself. Right, thank you so very much, and best of luck for, the, for your future endeavors. Well, thank you, Francois, for this uh, enlightening uh, approach. And um, uh, you, uh, uh, you uh, take a, a sort of a a broader view uh, than might be expected. Uh, social usefulness is something that has to be uh, taken, taken into account.